Number one, you all owe me an apology. Number two, no, it's still not as bad as All Stars 5. So I'm going to make sure that this video isn't all I told you so, but I do just want to say that a couple months ago, I did make a video about the way that casting trends were turning in terms of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. At the time, we were only about two episodes into All-Stars 8. And so was I preemptively on some hater shit? Yeah, probably. And it definitely reflected in both the comments and also the fact that that is still my most disliked video of all time. And the funny thing is that almost everything I said would happen in All-Stars 8 just by my judgment of the casting announcement and the first two episodes did happen. Like, to a T. And it's not like I'm actively rooting for All Stars to fail. Even though I had my problems with this season, I still had a pretty fun time with it because RuPaul's Drag Race in any way, shape, or form is inherently better than most other reality TV out there. But at the same time, I think it's worth noting and discussing that the current format is not only not serving the fans well, but it's clear that it's not serving the contestants well either. And we're gonna break it all down today, but before we get started, please give me a follow on all of these various social medias that I am currently cycling up on the screen and don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, hit the notification bell if you like me that much. If you don't though, I totally understand. And I'm almost at 50k! What the hell? That's crazy. Thank you all so much. I love doing this and I really appreciate you all. Okay, I talked about this a little bit the last time that I discussed All Stars 8, but in order to really break down what did not work with this season, we have to talk about the cast and specifically the way that production decided to handle the cast this time around. This is not me saying that the cast is bad. There is no bad cast of Drag Race in terms of individual queens. However, a makeup of a cast can really make or break how a season turns out. Here's the way I see it. The majority of the queens on this cast were queens who were either eliminated early or haven't competed on a season of Drag Race in quite some time or some combination of those two. Then you had a smaller group of queens who were either on a more recent season like 12 or 13 or queens like Darian and Alexis who competed a little farther back in terms of the timeline but they were higher placers. And then you had one queen who was the first queen from an international franchise to join an American All-Star season the same year that Global All-Stars has been announced vaguely. And not only that but this this is her third time competing. On top of that, she has had the added benefit of competing on a Verse the World season where All Stars rules are in effect and was more or less screwed by the fact that she fell into the bottom and another queen eliminated her. So it was pretty obvious, to me at least, from the get-go, that this season was going to be narratively crafted for Jimbo. However, as talented of a queen as Jimbo is, she does have some limitations in the sense that she is such a strong competitor that they could never put her in the bottom for challenges she was weaker at because somebody would immediately send her home like Pangina did. And she has the same issue as Jinx in that she's not as strong of a lip synker, so putting her in the top two consistently was warranted in most cases, but it wasn't entertaining and it just showed how weak of a performer she was in comparison to other queens on the cast. That is naturally a frustrating arc to contend with for everyone watching at home. And I don't mind that Jimbo is a strong competitor. I don't think it's the worst idea in the world to have a narrative centered around one queen who is destined to win. However, you have to make everything else around it seem believable, and that's where the casting here kind of fell apart. There were no stakes to Jimbo's narrative because they eliminated the only two queens who could hold a candle to her comedically, Kasha and Darian, pretty early on. She was never going to land in the bottom, even in the challenges that she was weak at because production knew that the minute she landed in the bottom, if the other queens were smart, they would send her home. And then they tried to compensate for any lack of conflict in Jimbo's arc by every episode setting up this situation where Jimbo would like stumble or pretend to falter and then it was clear that she had it in the bag every time but they would play us as if Jimbo was finally gonna land in the bottom for a challenge and then it never happened. So the best way to have kept Jimbo's narrative intact would have been to give her some actual competitors to make the stakes feel more real. The queen that got the closest to that this season was Jessica but it was clear that the producers didn't really take her seriously as a top three or two contender because they only gave her one challenge win despite the fact that she really shined in a lot of the challenges, which I don't think a lot of people expected because she was from an older season and people didn't know her well. And maybe this was a hindsight 2020 thing, but she was really the breakout star for every fan of the show for All Stars 8. 
And I think that was such a missed opportunity, but I think that's more of like a, you know, we couldn't predict that type of thing. And Jessica is really more emblematic of the fact that the majority of this cast just really felt underutilized the whole time. Yeah, obviously a lot of them are lower placers or older season queens, so they're not exactly going to hit it out of the park when it comes to aspects of modern drag race. But outside of a couple positive moments, like the Rusical where everyone did really well and the true crime improv challenge that I thought was actually really funny, it just felt like a lot of the queen's arcs and the challenges fell kind of flat. James is another good example when we're talking about this because I feel like she was supposed to go farther. She, in the beginning, was getting placed high in a lot of challenges, and that was clearly causing some tension with the other queens to the point to where she fell on the bottom. They all unanimously agreed to vote her off, and it seems like backstage there was a lot of tension with James, but none of that was ever explained, so it just felt really confusing to the viewer. Meanwhile, the Heidi quitting drama, and by extension the Kahana quitting drama, was definitely good for the drama factor of the season because it did get a little boring and a little sluggish at points, but I have a feeling we didn't see the entire story of that either. My thing is that it's very clear that the longer All Stars goes on, the more certain queens are starting to feel really let down by their experience and obviously it's a competition not everything is going to work out every which way for everyone but the fact that some of these queens are getting this opportunity to return and present new elevated drag in front of the fan base and not one but two of them felt like they were under so much pressure that they needed to quit just screams to me that the producers are getting really sloppy with the fact that they are rigging a game because obviously they are but they're not doing a good enough job of keeping it convincing for the queens or the audience and the audience can definitely feel that i think this problem is also exacerbated by the format of all stars and i think what i've pinpointed in terms of the problem with the voting format for the all star seasons is like Every year, the queens decide that they're going to vote by some sort of moral quandary about who they believe deserves to stay after talking with the queen where the queen pleads their case. And in the normal seasons, that's not how this works at all. Like, who are these queens to be the moral arbiter of whether or not somebody deserves to stay on a reality show competition when that's not how the original show is even judged? In regular Drag Race, the eliminations are theoretically decided by who performs the best in the lip sync, if not who is performing best for the producer's narrative. And of course, this all factors into how the queens ultimately vote, more so now than it did back in All Stars 2 when this was new and fresh. For example, people getting pissed off at Alexis over her elimination of Lala makes no sense to me. Constantly putting these queens in a position where they need to vote each other off, despite the fact that the show does not need to be configured this way, in fact, it works better when it's not configured this way, and then all of a sudden applying this vague moral code to whether or not a queen deserves to stay because of XYZ and what happened, is just bullshit. A Alexis played the game just like everybody else did, and obviously, yeah, I wanted Lala to go farther, but I, I can't fault Alexis for that. I can fault the producers for locking the queens in this bum-ass format for so long. Even to the point that Alexis admitted that the reason she kept Candy was that she was afraid of any retaliation because she knew the producers were big fans of Candy. And I'll get to Candy in a second, don't worry. But personally, I feel like the voting aspect of All Stars has become super played out. And I think that's doing a disservice to the audience because the queens are just naturally becoming more worn out and apathetic to the whole experience. Like, they truly don't give a shit about keeping the reality TV illusion alive. To the point that they're actively spoiling the seasons that they're on on Twitter as they're airing. And yeah, it's obnoxious and the queens shouldn't be doing that. But at the same time, I do kind of feel for them because this format sucks. It's very apparent that it sucks. And I I think it would just be a more pleasant and enjoyable and even ground type of experience for the queens and the audience if they just put all stars back to regular drag race rules. No one's gonna listen to me, I know no one's gonna listen to me, but I'm right. Okay, let's talk about Jimbo and Candy as a top two and the fame games and everything that came with the last couple of episodes. You guys all know that I hate top fours, so I wasn't exactly mad when a top three happened and then it became a top two. However, what was strange to me was that it felt like we had this top two for three solid episodes and they did the same thing every episode. Basically, the makeover challenge happened with a top three, which weird choice, but okay. And then we had the Fame Games extravaganza episode, which was basically the talent show. And in the talent show, Jimbo and Candy did presumably what was going to be their intro talent show act had the talent show been done the first episode. And then in the finale, we basically had them do the same thing again. 
And I know that was intercut with a lot of the other fame game stuff with the eliminated queens, and I'll get to that in a second, but first I do want to center in on Jimbo and Candy. First of all, here is my rant about Candy Muse. Everyone needs to shut the fuck up, bro. I get it. Candy is polarizing to the majority of the fan base. She is supposed to be that way. The producers want to naturally elicit that reaction out of you. She is good reality TV, and this is a reality TV competition. As much as you're annoyed by Candy's presence, it is even more annoying to go on the RuPaul's Drag Race subreddit every day and see some variation of, am I the only one who doesn't see what the judges see in Candy Muse? Could she have been in the bottom a couple more times throughout her run on All Stars 8? Yeah, sure, I guess, but for the most part, I think the judging surrounding her was actually pretty fair. It was honestly more fair than the way Jimbo was judged. And I like Jimbo, I like Candy, I like them both. And this is coming from somebody who wanted a Jimbo and Jessica top two. I get it, I understand frustrations with what people call production plot armor, but I feel like this disproportionately gets thrown toward Candy Muse more than anyone else. And at this point, it's boring. It's boring and it crosses into mean-spiritedness and bullying of her weight and her accent for no reason. I just feel like with every other queen who is given a little bit more perceived favoritism than others, most of the time people are rational enough to be like, you know what, that's an annoying choice by production. But with Candy, for some goddamn reason, everyone is so hellbent on tearing this person down. It's, it's not like she asked to be in the top two on both of the seasons she was on. It's not like she went up to production and was like, hey, can I be top two? It's not like she paid anybody off. It's so dramatic and honestly, it's a little fat phobic and racist. I'm just gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it. Fuck you. Anyway, let's talk about what really lost me this season was the handling of the fame games. First of all, hot take, I don't think the fame games counts as a twist. I know every all-star season is hellbent on having some twist, whether that's the format itself or a game within a game, returning queens challenge, and All-Stars 8 didn't have any of that. What it had was the Fame Games, which is a fan vote contest where people can vote on the queen's runway packages after they get eliminated, and that person will win a certain amount of money. At least that's how it was presented to begin with. Then all of a sudden, in the Fame Games extravaganza talent show, we're told that actually not only are the runways being taken into account, but these talent show performances that we should have done in the first fucking episode are also being taken into account, because whoever does the best in the talent show will receive a chance to get a multiplier for their votes. Which negates the purpose of the entire fucking Fame Games to begin with, because then it's clearly not entirely based on the runway package, it's based on a performance that can give you a significant advantage, which is what we know ended up happening. And don't get me wrong, I love Lala Ree. I think her talent show performance single-handedly saved this season for me. It was fucking fantastic, and yeah, she should win something for it. But they didn't even let her have that victory because they had her lip sync against James for the other top spot, and then they had the lip sync tie, so both girls got a boost in their fame game votes. Why put these complicated formats into anything if we're not gonna actually follow through with any of them? It's also the same way I felt with like the fucking quadratic formula they did to have Candy in the makeover challenge decide who was gonna go home. Like, at that point, just don't do a lip sync. If either way, Candy is gonna be forced to vote someone off. I don't understand why we make everything so goddamn complicated and then we go, you know what? Everyone wins. Everyone gets a tie. Everyone gets all the fame game votes. Just everyone gets a free 10,000 fame game votes. It doesn't matter. Who fucking cares? The finale I thought was pointless, but I think all of the finale episodes are pointless, especially when they're pre-taped like this. Because we knew how this episode was going to play out, right? The queens were gonna get their final 10,000th choreography and original song challenge. Then they were gonna have to learn the choreography and ooh, oh no, they're struggling. Then we get to the actual performance and then they get nothing but good critiques so there is nothing to distinguish either competitor anyway. At one point, Ross Matthews literally like looked at Candy and was like, she could win this whole competition. Yeah, really? We're at the top two. I would hope that she could win the whole competition. God damn. Then somebody gets crowned. We do a zillion fake taped reactions that have no actual emotion or impact. And then we see the real genuine reaction like four hours later on Twitter. This is obviously not specific to this all-star season. They've been doing this for a while now, but Paramount has got to figure out a better way to distribute all-stars. 
I remember when All Stars 2 and All Stars 3 were weekly events where everyone watched at the same time and there were watch parties at the bars and everyone was excited. And now the episode gets dumped on Paramount Plus at 3 a.m. The winner gets spoiled depending on what time zone you're in. It's not a satisfying conclusion for anybody. Jimbo and Candy are doing a crowning, quote unquote, in New York City a little later tonight and they already know who won, so what the fuck is the point? They need to put it back on cable. I understand that streaming at the very least is accessible for everyone and maybe they should have some kind of streaming option or counterpart. I, I agree with that. But having the All-Star seasons be streaming exclusives just really perpetuates the fact that kinda nobody gives a shit anymore. Which sucks because I feel like if handled correctly, All-Stars could be a huge thing for Paramount and MTV and whoever else. It has so much potential and that's why it's so frustrating to see them drop the ball season after season. And no, before you ask, I don't think All-Stars 9 being not a limb is gonna fix it. As far as Jimbo as a winner, I don't disagree. I think she did a great job. I just wish she would have had some stronger competition throughout her run on All-Stars. And yeah, I don't know. I know that there's a lot of controversy around Jimbo and the way she presents drag and the way she embodies the womanly form. I've said this before, I personally don't feel that way as an AFAB person, but I understand the concerns from people who do. There was no way anyone else was gonna win this season. If the producers were smart, they would have pushed Jessica all the way to the end, and maybe that could have resulted in a better situation for everyone. But like I said, Jimbo's crowning is very important to the franchise because they're expanding into global all-stars. It makes perfect sense that she won. Congratulations, Jimbo. You're great. Can't wait to see what you do with the crown. One more thing before I go, for the love of God, if we're gonna continue to do the All-Stars lip sync assassin format, can we at the very least get actual lip sync assassins? I'm not gonna say anything more than that because I don't wanna like put anybody down. I understand that one performance isn't emblematic of a queen's entire ability or whole thing, but if you're so hellbent on including a lip sync in every single episode, it better be a good lip sync if it's not a lip sync for your life. I think that's actually a really crucial part of the show that has been missing in All Stars for a little while now. We kind of got it with All Star 6 and then kind of never again. Anyway, this was fun. I'm sure the comments will be entirely civil and productive for sure. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Not a soaking clock. Not a soaking clock. Not a soaking clock.